arthritis can be treated conservatively for a long period of time. Um, I have no uh, declarations. So most of the patellofemoral osteoarthritis that we see is in association with tibiofemoral osteoarthritis. And uh, true isolated um, uh, patellofemoral osteoarthritis is quite rare, 3.8% uh, um, shown by Barrett. It's usually in women. It's often bilateral. Um, it's most commonly associated with patellofemoral maltracking and malalignment. 90% of patellofemoral osteoarthritis is lateral lateral patellofemoral disease. There are idiopathic uh, um, instances. Um, there is some post-traumatic, uh, obviously. We've done a study looking at uh, PFOA after ACL reconstruction and found 41% of patients have some degree of patellofemoral osteoarthritis after an ACL reconstruction. And of course, there's iatrogenic uh, patellofemoral osteoarthritis. Um, an example up, up on the top left uh, of your very typical uh, lateral uh, patellofemoral osteoarthritis. The next one is uh, an idiopathic uh, osteoarthritis. And this is a um, more unfortunate uh, iatrogenic and medial patellofemoral osteoarthritis. Treatment options. Um, well, I'm not talking about conservative, but I, I believe that's a, probably the larger part of management of this, this condition. With regards to surgical options, um, arthroscopy, including uh, lateral release, facetectomy, chondral resurfacing, realignment, patella osteotomy, replacement, and patellectomy. And I'll briefly mention all of those. As always, there are a number of uh, factors to consider in the equation as to deciding what to tell this patient is best for them. Age, weight, importantly, psychosocial uh, um, uh, issues the severity of the symptoms, the activity level and expectations, the alignment of both the patellofemoral joint and the tibiofemoral joint, um, and the degree of pathology. Um, these are two nice papers uh, from the radiology literature showing that patellofemoral osteophytes are more significantly associated with pain than tibiofemoral osteophytes, and that reduced uh, patellochondral volume uh, is more significantly associated with pain and poorer function than tibiofemoral volume, so I thought it was quite interesting. Arthroscopy. Arthroscopy has uh, um, a limited uh, uh, value when dealing with bone-on-bone patellofemoral osteoarthritis. As always, um, a, 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 an indication we lose bodies and uh, um, impinging osteophytes. Very occasionally, uh, in the short term, with a young patient, uh, a washout for uh, um, uh, synovitis. But we know that it's not really a good option, um, just a, a clean out and debridement in the medium to long term. Microfracture, I did have a video but it's not working. But basically microfracture, I don't really believe it's an, it's an option in when you have bone on bone opposing surfaces. It's very difficult on the patella anyway to get a good microfracture. Um, there's no point doing a microfracture if, if there's malalignment and it's not indicated in bipolar disease. So I think microfracture has a very limited um, a value in the management of patellofemoral osteoarthritis. Lateral release. <clears throat> Probably my only indication for a lateral release in my practice is true excessive lateral pressure syndrome with patella tilt uh, without translation. Um, and that has been shown to have reasonably good results in the literature at five years. Um, and it's a matter of decreasing pain rather than uh, uh, resolving it altogether. So I think there is, a, is a, a very small place for lateral release in the condition of true excessive lateral pressure syndrome. So therefore my indications for arthroscopy uh, in this uh, disease would be an early presenter in a young patient, perhaps with a, a severe synovitis uh, and loose bodies, if I'm considering a lateral release, and also using it as an assessment for planning of future perhaps realignment procedures or uh, in planning um, types of knee replacements. Lateral patella facetectomy, uh, um, um, by removing that lateral facet of the patella, uh, has been shown to have uh, a fairly good um, results in the literature. I have not performed a, a lot of these, but some. This particular patient was a physiotherapist and had a fantastic result after removing that um, that lateral facet. So I think there is an indication on occasions 
but once again, you've got to look carefully at the at the imaging um, and, uh, and and assess the patient that you're dealing with. The realignment procedures. Uh, Mackay described his procedure in 1963. Um, it's for a normally tracking uh, uh, patella, which is quite rare in this condition, and it's associated with a very high uh, complication rate. So uh, I have to admit I've never actually performed a MACO procedure in my training or, or recently. Um, tibial tubercle antromedialization um, is, I think, now uh, the more common type of uh, realignment, realignment procedure, and it's for the more common lateral patella osteoarthritis with a laterally tracking patella and it's uh, relevant for younger patients. And of course, tibial tubercle lateralization uh, can be used uh, to treat iatrogenic medial patellofemoral osteoarthritis. And I want to focus on the Fulkerson procedure, uh, which is probably my main procedure I perform for uh, patellofemoral osteoarthritis. The idea is to translate the, the contact forces from the, from the patholo pathologic area laterally to medially and relieve the uh, lateral facet pressure. This has been shown uh, on numerous occasions to have very good results with regards to alleviating patient symptoms. But it must be in a patient that does have true lateral tracking. When you have medial disease or central disease, the results drop off very quickly for the Fulkerson procedure. My particular technique, I'll, I'll usually combine it with a lateral release and uh, perform a lateral incision, just dis dis lateral and distal to the tibial tubercle to try and avoid that uh, numbness over the uh, tibial tubercle. Through the uh, distal incision, I'll then perform a, a release along the lateral border of the patella tendon. I think it's very important to make sure that your distal lateral release is contiguous with your proximal lateral release. If there are some fibres still intact, the uh, patella and patella tendon won't translate medially well perform a long osteotomy, um, usually with a very small intact uh, um, cortical uh, bridge uh, distally, um, and I try and leave the medial periosteum intact. Um, and the osteotomy I perform with an osteotome uh, rather than a saw, I'm a bit, bit uh, nervous about uh, uh, heat necrosis. And uh, at that point, uh, internally rotate the foot and you are looking to get a, uh, an anteromedial angle. The amount of angle can vary according to whether you want more elevation or more medialisation. I think I normally uh, uh, trend towards more medialisation than, than anteriorisation. Um, I then mobilise the um, osteotomy with an osteotome and often hear a little crack of the distal cortex. And I'll then hold that in place with my osteotome uh, before fixing. And then I go about checking um, the, the amount of correction that I have. You'll have some idea preoperatively as to what you want to do, but as you all know, intraoperatively uh, it becomes kind of thumbs and fingers as opposed to you know, 0.1 of a millimetre. Um, I'm looking for a tibial tubercle sulcus angle of about zero, and I'll check my uh, tracking uh, arthroscopically. And if I'm happy with that, um, still with my osteotome in place, I'll fix the uh, osteo osteotomy with uh, bicortical, uh, two bicortical screws. I think it's a very good indication for a young high demand patient with uh, um, lateral compartment uh, um, osteoarthritis. This um, patella osteotomy uh, has been described. I must admit I've never seen uh, or done it. Um, it's been re reported in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in 2010. Uh, basically, thinning the patella, um, reported satisfied patients at six years, whatever that means, uh, but a high rate of, I think, 65% of their patients went on to tibiofemoral osteoarthritis at six years. I thought I'd mention it, but I don't know a lot about it. ACI, um, Ledbetter described the patella femoral joint as a hostile environment uh, um, when dealing with chondral uh, um, injury. Um, once again, uh, the site of the lesion and realignment is very important when thinking about ACI. It's no good for bipolar disease, so it's not really an option for patellofemoral osteoarthritis. And it's all a bit of a moot point because it's been removed from the market in Australia at the present time. Which brings us to patellofemoral replacement. Um, I think the indications are, are need to be true isolated patellofemoral osteoarthritis, and therefore, by definition, should be a, a rare. Uh, surgery. 
in a low demand patient, uh, less than 60 years of age, and when all other options have been exhausted. Contraindications, uh, as always, uh, uh, really any contraindication to a, a uni disease. And the MAD, um, I think, is relevant to a, a slide I've got to, uh, coming up. So um, current designs are improving. I think the most important thing is the instrumentation is getting better and allowing us to implant uh, patellofemoral replacements better, particularly on the trochlear side. I think the patella is standard. You either resurface it or you, you inset it but the trochlea can be quite difficult to get right. And once again, um, I think uh, uh, tracking is, one, is very important with regards to a good result. And of the, the few patellofemoral replacements that I do, they're almost always combined with a concomitant to a realignment procedure. Now, there, um, there are uh, some very good uh, um, results uh, reported in the literature with regards to patellofemoral replacement. Ackroyd reported on 306. I think he does have an interest in the Avon prosthesis. Um, but there's, uh, you know, Dahl, Dahm uh, showed um, that the, it gives similar pain relief to a total knee, um, improved function and return to activity, and less blood loss in a shorter hospital stay. But Dahm also showed in that same paper that 22% of his patients had undiagnosed pain and that 42% of their patellofemoral osteoarthritic group had pre-existing psychiatric conditions as opposed to 21% in the general tibiofemoral osteoarthritic group. So this is a, and we all know that the patellofemoral group of patients can be difficult to deal with. Um, Saleh, Laskin, Mons, Delanois and Baker have shown that total knee replacement remains um, uh, the most proven predictable single procedure on older patients with patellofemoral osteoarthritis. A high number of revisions performed for unexplained pain after a well-performed uh, patellofemoral replacement, almost twice that of a total knee replacement, and that total knee replacements are better for older patients. My current fellow uh, from London, uh, Henry Burke, has just presented uh, this paper at the uh, Academy meeting in San Francisco, looking at patellofemoral osteoarthritis, a group of patellofemoral replacement the Avon knee versus a total knee replacement. And they found that their patellofemoral replacement had subjectively worse outcomes in their, their total knee uh, group. The average time to revision of a patellofemoral re replacement was 3.2 years. And that revision of a patellofemoral replacement to a total knee is not as good as a primary total knee. And therefore they concluded patellofemoral joint replacement must not be used as a temporising measure prior to a knee replacement. And I would ask this question, are you prepared to do a total knee on that patient? If not, then you shouldn't really be doing a, a, a patellofemoral replacement. Looking at our results, um, mostly it's for osteoarthritis. Uh, most patients were female, as would be expected. There was a cumulative percentage revision rate of patellofemoral replacement, so 23% 20, at seven years. Most of those for progression of disease i.e. it probably wasn't isolated patellofemoral osteoarthritis in the first place, loosening and undiagnosed pain. Males did, uh, fared worse than females and uh, younger patients had a higher revision rate, as would usually be the case. The hemicap is on the market and being used. I have no experience with this uh, prosthesis other than to revise it. Patelectomy, really it's historical. Um, there, there were good results back in 1978, but good being only 53%. Um, the rest were sort of poor or average. I think these days there are, there are plenty of suitable alternatives to patelectomy. Perhaps in severe trauma or deformity, uh, it's an option. And of interest, it's the conversion of uh, patelectomy to total knee. Uh, we'd normally be uh, um, advised to use a posterior stabilised total knee in that particular instance. In general, I think uh, I would mostly leave uh, the uh, patella tendon, but I'm interested in the tantalum. Um, I've not yet performed it myself, but uh, I'm certainly thinking about it in the patient uh, in the next few months. So in conclusion, I think true isolated patella femoral osteoarthritis is quite a rare condition. Um, many of these patients have poor psychological profiles. My most common procedures are arthroscopy with or without a lateral release, facetectomy, 
focus and procedure, which is probably my favourite, and total knee replacement for older patients with uh, a PFOA. But as I said to you at the very start, I think that PFOA, given it often doesn't affect patients walking on the flat, is very amenable to long-term conservative management. Thanks very much.